Arlington. Good evening. Uh, welcome to tonight's Arlington School Committee meeting. Today's date is Thursday, September 26, 2013, and it's 6.30 p.m. My name is Judson Pierce. I'm the chair of this fine committee. Uh, I'd like to once again take a page out of our former chair, Joe Kuro's playbook and offer a remembrance, a reflection, and a recognition. First, I'd like to take a moment to remember Barbara Weber, Weaver of Arlington. She passed away on September 16th. Barbara was a longtime employee of the Arlington Public Schools. She was married to Lawrence and the mother of Scott and his wife Maureen, Ellen and her husband Christopher, Maureen and her husband Jim, Catherine, who works as a teaching assistant at the Audison. Barbara is also the beloved grandmother of Cameron, Margaret, Patrick, Lauren, and Sean. Barbara's tenure here teaching at the Pierce Elementary and teaching at Jermaine Lawrence and serving as the Title I director and most recently handling science and English language arts at the Audison. She was a devoted member of St. Agnes's Parish. And may her memory be for a blessing and may we have a moment of silence. Thank you. For my reflection, I'd like to talk briefly about the month of September. It's here, but just for a little bit longer. I love this month, in part because it's my birthday month. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Me too? Yeah, and my oh. wedding anniversary. Good for you, congratulations. See? My wedding anniversary in September, I should have said that. Um, <laughs> oh. Uh oh. <laughs> I'll be turning 41 tomorrow. I'd like to oh, make a motion that we recognize your better half. <laughs> um, but I love this month for especially uh, why we, we here in New England love this month. Uh, we have many things uh, that other states and other parts of this country does, do not share. Our schools start in September, generally. The Red Sox pushing their way towards the playoffs. And last but not least, the weather and the beauty of this place this time of year. Unbelievable colors, many of them reminiscent of the colors of the new Thompson School, actually, <laughs> inside now. One of my favorite singer-songwriters is James Taylor. He wrote a song entitled September Grass. He reflects on memories of September in that song that are relived with the cycle of the season once he takes time to breathe and take it all in. In his song, there's whimsy and cheer, and here are some of the lyrics I'm not going to sing. <laughs> uh, well, the sun's not so hot in the sky today, and you know I can see summertime slipping away. A few more geese are gone, a few more leaves turning red, but the grass is as soft as a feather in a feather bed. So I'll be king and you'll be queen. Our kingdom's going to be this little patch of green. Won't you lie down here right now on the September grass? At our last meeting, I asked all of us to remember that this new school year brings hope and opportunity and challenge. It's a chance to look back, review what we've accomplished last year, and where we need to go this year and the years ahead. Some of that today will be discussed with the introductory review of the MCAS results and the letter from the NIASC group, and we'll have more details to come in meetings. But what this month and what James Taylor's lyrics tell me is how important it is for us periodically to think about our past while cherishing our present and lying down on September grass because it won't be around for another year. As a recognition, I'd like to, uh, I was going to say I'd like to again <laughs> welcome our student rep. He might, or she might be a little bit late. I'd like to welcome Mr. Thielman, who just walked in. <laughs> Good to be here. Uh, and our first two guests of the evening, uh, our new high school principal, Matthew Janger, is with us tonight, as well as our new athletics director, Melissa Dugalecki. Uh, if you wouldn't mind coming, coming to the table, both of you, and join us. And uh, I know some of us are meeting you for the first time. <laughs> I just want to, I know that the conversation with Dr. Janker could go on a long time, but I want to let you know that he, he graciously agreed to come tonight, um, though Audison Open House is occurring at the same time, and his son is there, and uh, he needs to scoot at some point <laughs> I had here. to get special permission. Ah, excellent. Well, welcome. Some of us are ashamed some of us. There's, there's, there. there's a couple others here tonight like that, yeah. 
didn't know if um, you had any prepared remarks or if we should just open it up to the committee members to speak and ask. I, I mean, I didn't have prepared remarks, which wouldn't stop me from speaking off the cuff. Um, <laughs> certainly not as articulately as your opening statements. I think I actually have met yeah, just about everyone here. Um, it's been a great start to the year. It's been a real, someone once described starting a principal ship as drinking from a fire hose. And I will say another joke people make is they talk about um, how you don't want to be doing the last job. And there are things that I have expectations for myself of when I come to this job. And I would say it's all good, but it's coming awfully fast. There's an <laughs> awful lot of it. Um, but it's been really very exciting. I mean, the, the team of people I get to work with administratively, most of being one of those, but also everybody else really is stepping up and doing really interesting things and helping me to understand the school. The faculty are excited and exciting. Um, we started already, I mean, I came in with a, a goal to do nothing <laughs> or to do as little as possible because there is so much already going on. Um, we had already identified that we wanted to be working on assessment. Um, the whole question of the year being, how do we know students are really learning what it is they really need to know? And I keep reminding people there are two pieces to that. We need to be clear on what it is they really need to know. And we then need to ask the question of how do we know that they're learning it? Because if you do either one in, it, in isolation, you end up in a very uncomfortable place in schools. And I think there's been a lot of history of that in the current political reforms. There'll be a huge effort on measuring what can be measured without attention to making sure we know what it is we need to know or there'll be a lot of attention to discussing what everyone needs to know without much attention to whether or not kids are actually getting what it is we're working on. So I think it's really important that we're doing both, but that's a big task. The evaluation system is another big task and somewhat stress producing for teachers and administrators. Um, but as we've gone around and talked to groups, big and small, I think when you sit down with the teachers and say, what this is really about is a commitment with an obligation, but a commitment on the part of administrators to actually be in your classes and have conversations with you and learn more about what it is you're doing so that we can work better together as a faculty, that really kind of lowers the temperature. The reality is there's a lot of concern about what happens if I do wrong, but the vast majority of teachers are not in that boat. So for the vast majority of teachers, it's an opportunity for them to teach me what they do and for me to give them an idea of kind of where we want to move all together. Um, and so that's been really productive. Um, I've made a commitment, which I'm hoping I can keep, to getting in and doing an observation with every single teacher. That's 100 observations. Um, I've got three, which puts me ahead of a lot of people. But the hard part is doing the observation so much as getting the teacher in then and having the formal conversation. That becomes a big scheduling project. Um, but we have the calendar, and we're going to get going on it pretty quickly. Um, and then the last piece, which isn't something really coming from the outside, but from an impetus that we have, um, is the question of the building, which um, I understand that we are committed to putting in a statement of interest in the middle of this year. And what I wanted to talk to the faculty about is, one, we have a necessity that we say to the Massachusetts School Building Authority what is going on, why we instructionally need the new building. That's not a hard case to make. But more importantly, um, we need to talk about where we want to go, what kind of a building we want to get, so that we end up with the building we want. When we started this conversation, someone delivered to my office the 25-year-old plans for the high school that they proposed to build 25 years ago that we didn't get. Um, it's a beautiful building. Um, if we had it, we would love it in many ways, but it is not the building we would want today. Um, and so if you think back 25 years when they designed this beautiful building, we'd be happier if we had it, but it would still not be the building we want. And so we want to think 10, 20, 50 years into the future um, because this building is going to be a major commitment for this whole community. It's going to shape the whole community of Arlington. So we want to really think about what is the instruction we want so that when we get the building, it fits. Um, at the same time, you have a challenge in a high-performing district like this, which is getting faculty to really feel the impetus to make the effort to really change instruction in a deep way. People are already getting good effects, good impacts. And so how do you get that conversation to take place? One of the exciting things about the building project is immediately when people started listing off 
all the things they would want to see in the building, a sort of wish list that sort of started naturally as part of the conversation. When you looked at that list, there was actually a vision of instruction that you could take from that inductively, um, deductively actually, um, that you could take from that, which was of instruction that was collaborative, infused with technology, um, embedded in actual practice and context in the community, not just in the classroom, flexible to meet a variety of student needs. And it's not instruction that we are entirely able to do or that we entirely know how to do well now. But it is something that people are interested in doing, that people who are thinking forward want to do. And so that's an exciting conversation. Um, so those are the big efforts that we want to do this year. It's a first year for a teacher, for me. Um, people have just come off of two years of NEASC, which um, I have ambivalences about as a process. I've just come out of uh, three years of NEASC in my previous school. And one of the challenges of NEASC is that at its best, that's a reflective process of strategic planning and getting outside feedback. But unfortunately, I think there are elements of that process that have become about implementing a model that NEASC has in their head and doesn't fit with that same process. You can't really implement someone else's model and do reflective practice and strategic planning at the same time. Um, so NEASC is wonderful in that they agree with us that we need a new building for instructional reasons. Um, and you're gonna see the letter this afternoon. And so that's a good validation to the community that we're not just complaining, that it really is something that we should expect and that would be a standard National, you know, nationally in the state with other places. Um, but at the same time, I think it's helpful to step back from broad strategic planning to realize we already have some direction. And what we really need to do is work on, at this point, having some effective changes. The pieces that we're already doing, I think, are going to move us in the direction the state wants us to go, that the community wants us to go, moving towards the standards that are being adopted nationally. Uh, what I think is also then really important, and I just met with our faculty senate, who I believe have just unilaterally renamed themselves the um, Faculty Advisory Council because they're not really elected anymore. They're sort of self-identified. So we're going to let anyone who wants to be a member but just have that as an ongoing conversation. And what they'd really like to see is efforts that are focused on getting stuff done that's going to make life better for teachers and have a positive impact on instruction. That's what teachers want to do. And so we talked about making it small and effective as opposed to trying to do the broad strategic plan. I think if you do that for a couple of years as a new principal, especially when there's already a plan in place on the part of the state and the district as a whole, you actually start to make progress and really make changes as opposed to, I'm a big fan of strategic planning, I spend a lot of energy on it, but you can spend an awful lot of time getting back to the starting line when you're just trying to gather up. And they've already gone through that process of reflection. So I think that's where we want to move going forward. I guess that's enough of my unprepared remarks if anyone has any questions. Go ahead. I'll ask you one question. Um, when you were doing the tours of, um, and meeting with um, the parents at that night, one of the things that you said that interested a lot of our high school students was the idea of an open campus and looking into it. So I got asked at dinner, when are they going to make the high school an open campus? And I'm curious whether that's something that you're still interested in looking towards. Pursuing. I am. I don't remember saying that, but that would explain why people keep asking me. Um, you know, I think, again, I'm trying to understand how the campus works and then who would be the appropriate people to talk to and when you have that kind of conversation. Um, most importantly to me, I'm, I'm not convinced that the community or the school as it runs right now would want to have a fully open campus. When you're unassigned, you can come and go as you please. Directed studies are supposed to be instructional time. Um, so in a student's mind, that may be a time I can come and go as I please, but that's not in the mind of the school or the educators. Um, that said, the question I have is when we have large numbers of students during times when they are not particularly supervised and not particularly engaged, um, would it be easier to control the building and better and more sort of straightforward to let those students earn the privilege to use that time the way they saw fit? So I think you'd have to talk 
to the school committee about that. We'd have to look at the logistics. We'd have to talk to the police. Um, but I would imagine right now we have senior privileges. We have old hall. We have the directed studies. And so we have little bits and pieces of that. Um, but what I'd like to see is if you've earned the right to leave the school because you've demonstrated that you're responsible with your use of that time and you come let us know when you're leaving, you let us know when you're coming back, um, I just as soon let students go. That's my preference, but I think that's not entirely up to me. I think that's a big conversation. If you're in the school, you're in places that we know you're supposed to be in and you're supervised, so we don't have students moving around. We don't have an awful lot of people to patrol those halls. Um, and if you have demonstrated in those areas or with those freedoms that you are either not getting your work done or not behaving or leaving campus without permission, then you lose those privileges and you're in much more structured areas. So I'd like that to be some sort of a stepped process. Um, the uh, deans and assistant principal and I have talked about it a lot and we're sort of looking at how things run. They're trying to tighten up things the way they work um, and try to understand what that would mean from my perspective and their perspective. I'd also say one other piece of that is I've gone to the student council and tried to talk to them about not being a prom committee but being a student council. Um, and I think they're moving in that direction. Melissa's doing similar things with the captain's council. Um, but it's baby steps. Um, so their first step in that is to say, okay, little question, big answer. Um, their first step was to say, okay, we want to do a pride week. And for us to say, okay, well, the goal on this spirit week, homecoming week, has to be to develop school culture, school community, to get the school I care values as something we actually do and live with. And they've taken that on. So the idea there is now they're mission driven, not just having a party. Um, but when I said to them, look, I want you to come to me and say, here's what we think an open campus might look like, because someone mentioned that. Here's how we think the rules might work in a way that would make the community comfortable, make the administration comfortable, and give us the flexibility we want. Um, they sort of glazed over like, we don't have any idea how to do that. But I think by the end of the year they will. Students are pretty quick learners, unlike the rest of us. Um, they're much quicker than we are. So I think it's not something I would see happening this year, but I could see making baby steps towards it in the next year. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say um, I wanted to thank you for all the communication. I am a high school parent, so it's been great having all the um, emails and communication on what's going on in the school. I think that's been really great. Um, and congratulations on a wonderful open house last week. I had had uh, the NIASC letter before I went to that open house, and I had read, read through it. And I, you know, I know that the high school has certain things, but I actually personally had an obstructed view in my son's AP physics class, couldn't see the teacher, and sat in a chemistry class of 30 students that has 25 desks. So <laughs> I personally did, uh, you know, uh, kind of experience that, and it was very interesting. And, um, you know, they all actually mentioned it in the open house about the, you know, especially in science, I know that we need some work on the science classroom. So. Um, I know that that was, it was interesting to have actually have lived it, not having had actually sat in those classes before. So that was kind of eye-opening for me. So I'm sure it's been eye-opening for you as well as you yes. visit all of these classes. Yes, I just, I mean, <coughs> I've had three observations and in just the second one I was sitting there and the teacher student said, where is such and so in a Latin class? And the teacher said, it's on the board. And the student said, where? And the teacher said, it's on the board. And then both the student and I went like this. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you and welcome. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I definitely want you to be able to go to the Audison. Thank you. I have to listen to Melissa a little. She's very good. <laughs> um, good segue there. Melissa, welcome. Sure, thank you. Um, we'd love to hear a little bit about your first month so far and what it's been like and any, anything else, uh, any updates or anything you'd like to tell us right now. Sure. Um, well, thank you for having me, and um, I've really enjoyed my transition here. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay. My transition here into Arlington, um, working here a little bit over the summer and then um, getting in full time, it's been really exciting and finding ways to capitalize on the energy of the students and the coaches and the community um, has been really gratifying. 
Some of the things that we're trying to do uh, in athletics, we are really looking at unifying the department. Um, it became clear that there are certain common denominators and constants that were shared in terms of all the teams were passionate and all the teams were working hard. Um, but a lot of the teams were kind of running, you know, running their own programs. Um, so we're trying to bring everyone together. We uh, came up with the slogan of uh, 30 teams, one family, we are Arlington. And we've really been pushing that um, not just because it's a nice slogan, but because it's really our goal for this year. We want the teams to feel as though they're a part of a team. So just as though if they're on maybe the soccer or volleyball team and they contribute to something better, or not better, bigger, um, in their program, that um, a member of the cross country team um, or the golf team and the football team, that they all together combine to something bigger than their individual program. Um, the coaches have been wonderful. Um, very receptive to that. The student athletes have been really excited about that. Their energy is contagious. Um, we have started a captain's council. Um, as Matthew mentioned, we meet um, once a week before school and the captains come and right now as I'm transitioning in, I do a lot more listening. Um, just talking about the history, their experiences, their goals and trying to you know, develop a strong understanding of what does it mean to be a leader. Um, what does it mean to be a captain? And that's a role that, you know, is a privilege and it's important and it has an opportunity for a large audience. Um, and they have the opportunity to, to um, set an example to their programs. Um, and they've really stepped up. Um, you know, I challenged them to come up with community service projects. Um, and all the teams have had some wonderful ideas. I believe field hockey is um, doing something at the senior center. Um, Cross Country will be working with the Conservation Committee this weekend, and we had other teams at Town Day. Um, so they're all coming up with creative ideas and really, you know, thinking beyond uh, just the athletic field, which has been nice. Um, you know, in addition, we uh, have redone the website, which has been helpful in getting communication out. Um, the captains are charged with putting the score updates in, um, so it gives them a little bit of accountability and responsibility uh, there. Um, and then it also provides schedules for the families, which has been helpful. You know, other than that, it's really just been getting out to the field, seeing the teams, working with the kids. Um, we had a, a parent athlete night, uh, parent athlete coach night at the beginning of the year, and the attendance was uh, tremendous. I'm trying to think of, you know, there was most at least 20 people. Yeah. <laughs> Bigger than any parties I've done. It was. It was. Um, you know, we weren't sure what to expect, but. You know, in the red gym, both sides of the bleachers were pretty oh, much you're filled. About that. That yeah. Like yeah, there's probably about a thousand people there. Meeting. No, no. Um, the parent athlete coach is meeting, and it was just a wonderful opportunity to sit with the community and talk about our philosophy um, and what we see as the bigger picture. And I talked a lot about um, the fact that you know, 100% of the student athletes in there, um, you know, they were athletes. That's why they were there. Um, and that statistically 60% of them um, wanted to play collegiate athletics or had aspirations to do so. Um, but statistically only 2% would and less than half a percent would get a scholarship. Um, however, on the positive side, 100% statistically speaking um, are more likely to attend a four-year college, um, more likely to have jobs in a leadership role um, more likely to have less of a dropout, or less likely to have a dropout rate, um, less likely to have discipline issues throughout high school. So we set that as the platform to really talk about if that's, you know, if that's what you're gaining here, um, why are you more likely to attend a four-year college? Is it because your soccer skills are really good? Probably not. It's probably because of these skills that you're learning. And we talked a lot about communication and accountability and teamwork. Um, which was nice, and I think the athletes um, and the community were really receptive to it. Um, I shared with them, you know, anyone who might have uh, read, you know, my bio, it, it highlights my athletic um, successes. You know, I um, was fortunate to be a Division I um, athlete, but I also was cut from my basketball team, and my track coach told me hurdles were not my thing. Um, and I learned as much from those experiences, truly, as I did from the ones in which I persevered more easily. Um, and similarly, I've coached at the collegiate um, development level, varsity level, JV level, but I've also coached youth sports um, and Special Olympics. And 
you know, I've learned as much from the youth and Special Olympic athletes that I did at the collegiate level. And really talking about no matter what level at, you're at, it's really just about developing these life skills and building relationships with the athletes um, and instilling a sense of confidence and pride. Um, so that's really our philosophy, and it, it's been a nice transition. I wasn't stopping. No, go ahead. Mr. Mr. Hainer. Before you leave, I'd like to thank both of you uh, for the new sports website. Uh, uh. Not a great athlete myself. Well, <laughs> I know she has to go through you, too. So uh, it's, it's exciting, and uh, I would recommend it to the audience as well to take a look at it, especially the calendar. Yes. Uh, it, it's, it's just fantastic. And oh, I don't have to you. go looking every which way like I used to to find yeah. out when the football game things <laughs> of that nature. So thank yeah, you very much. Great. Thank you very much. Good night. Miss Hunt. Um, I wanted to commend you because some of what you've been doing with the coaches clearly is, um, is helping them in terms of encouraging younger athletes. A lot of them have gone out of their way to make connections with middle schoolers and to spend their time with that and, and to that end I wondered um, if you started looking towards middle school and elementary and things that we might do to bolster um, our programs at that level and provide our students with those same benefits? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. Um, you know, athletics, it's, we're focused on the high school, but it really is a community, an opportunity for the community to come together. Um, and we are hosting a youth night on October 4th um, for our youth football and cheerleaders. Uh, those athletes will be called onto the field before the game. Um, they're gonna be escorted by our high school players. At halftime, the Pop Warner coaches are gonna run mini games um, on the field. So they'll get to be under the lights on the turf and kind of get a, a sense of that excitement. Um, Matthew and I reached out to the elementary school principals to see if um, any of them had core students that would be brave and willing to come sing the anthem. Um, we just want to find ways to involve um, the younger levels. And we'll be um, doing a very similar night, uh, running the same way the following week for the youth soccer programs. Um, and as we you know, work with more youth programs, that's something we'd like to do every season. Uh, I've worked with the middle school principal in terms of setting up uh, something in the spring to have an information night. I know that transition from eighth grade to freshman year is very challenging in general. Um, and for a lot of fall athletes, their very first experience at Arlington High School will be on an athletic field. Um, so we want to get out there in May, um, talk about the process, give them the information, um, and build that relationship. So baby steps right now, but I agree absolutely, you know, capitalizing on those relationships will be huge. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, very, yeah. Very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Spending some time with us tonight. We look forward to hearing as the year goes on. Great, thank you so much. And the league um, provides school committee passes, so I'll give them um, to Karen and she can <coughs> hold on to them for you guys. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to take the opportunity to welcome Siobhan Foley uh, here tonight. Welcome Siobhan, uh, our AEA rep. And uh, seeing no public participation, why don't we move on uh, to a presentation <coughs> by Dr. Bodie on the June 7, 2003 corrected version of September 11th NEASC report, or letter. Right. We use the acronym NEASC a lot, but just for those people who may be first to hearing this, this, this stands for the New England Association of Schools and Colleges. Um, it is the Commission on Public Schools uh, and Secondary Schools for the accreditation. And the process is a, this, or I should say the cycle is every 10 years. And in preparation for the visit, there are usually a two-year self-reflection, a lot of committee work, a lot of paper that's generated, and then we have the visit. And as you are aware, we had the visit um, last fall. In fact, um, our first go at that visit was during uh, right around the hurricane time, and so we had to postpone it. Um, later in March, and we, we went through, a, we got a report from the, uh, the committee that had been here. Um, that went through a couple of drafts, and that, that report has been on our website now since, I believe, it was been easily March, I think. Karen may 
be able to correct me on that. But when, when we've had the final draft of the report sent to us, uh, uh, there was a, a waiting period that we needed to go through and then it was posted. But the second phase of this is actually the letter that you get from New England, from NEAS, uh, saying whether you're accredited or not. And then outlining the various um, uh, topics, issues that they want you to address in a two-year report, then there's a five-year report, and then of course once you, you, know, you, you conclude that, you'll be almost ready for the next part of the cycle. So the first uh, letter um, was, it was issued in early June, and again, um, similar to the report itself, it goes through a, a series of drafts and discussions, and that happened um, over the course of the summer. And in fact, um, Dr. Janger was involved in, a, in a, at least one or two of those conversations with me. So the letter um, you received in your packet, and uh, to, tomorrow we will actually post it on our website for everyone to see, and, and, and as you, um, as you heard uh, Dr. Jenger talking about this, there are uh, certain recommendations they have. But first let me just begin with the commendations. And I, and I really don't, uh, I'm not planning, believe me, to read all four or five pages of this letter. I, I don't want to do that. But at the same time, I think it's really important uh, to, to point out a lot of the commendations that have been made. And if you've had a chance to read the report, which is, quite lengthy um, and by different uh, categories, you know that it was a very thorough look and, and, and actually quite, quite complimentary of what's going on in the high school. Um, but they were very impressed with many of the programs and services and, uh, and in the letter say they wish to co um, commend the following. And, and really there's about 30 commendations and they go through some more, but let me just read a couple of them. Um, the identification of a set of values, I care, embodied in the vast majority of students and professional staff that positively impacts the culture of the school. The identification of learning expectations that are challenging, measurable, address academic, social, and civic competencies. The ongoing development of a common curriculum template through the use of Atlas Rubicon. Teachers who are committed to delivering high quality curriculum to all students. The teacher's emphasis on depth of understanding and application of knowledge through inquiry, problem solving, higher order thinking, authentic learning opportunities, both within and outside the school. Um, the incorporation of technology into the curriculum and emphasis on informal ethical use of technology. The work to create common assessments to validate the alignment of written and taught curriculum by academic departments. The commitment of teachers to high quality instruction. The specific timely and corrective feedback provided by teachers to ensure students revise and improve their work. And, and there's, there's more that go, that are presented in this, in this letter. Um, there are areas of uh, recommendation and one of them has, is, is a curriculum issue, and, and, and Dr. Jenga was alluding to this. They have a sort of a model, and one of their models is to develop a definite, uh, just one type of school-wide rubric um, that identify, that, that addresses 21st century learning expectations. And so that's one thing that they do want us to address a little bit more. We do have a school-wide rubric that is adapted to, a, to in all departments, in all assignments, in all projects. Um, but anyway, there are some more, but what, what Dr. Jenga was also alluding to is that as we go through what really become the focus of the recommendations, you will see that it's all about the physical building. Um, there are certainly things that we can address in the short term, but there are lots of things that we cannot address without um, fully looking at how, what we're going to do with this building. And I know we've had a lot of discussion here at the table. Um, there's already a committee that's been brought, brought together in the high school, which I met with the other day, uh, to talk about what the process is that we're going to be going forward with. And in fact, um, by January, in, according to the letter, we have to give NEASC a written report as to how we are going to address the physical needs that 
of the building that both, um, in their view, really become an impediment to the learning that that is going on in this building. And in fact, one of the things we even heard when the team was here is just how impressed they were with the quality of instruction, um, our students, their motivation and uh, interest in what they were doing, engagement. But to a person, they talked about the physical problems of this building. You know, going from one room in, in December that was <coughs> 90 something to another room that was below zero and I'm exaggerating but there was um, you know you could go to different parts of the building just even in that simple thing of the temperature of the of the room was a it was a problem I, I think that what has been um, of a particular concern has been our science labs they one are not of the size that MSBA even recommends we looked at uh, two years ago, not even two years ago, looking into whether we could apply for one of the science um, uh, science programs to expand and renovate our science labs, but we didn't qualify because none of our rooms matched what they said was the minimum square footage for the, the labs that they th wanted to see if they were going to invest money in these labs. But we have labs where they're inadequate to what we want to do. Um, there's the, the area where there might be the, the whole group instruction. There's poles that you, you can't see around, and Ms. Starks <laughs> alluded to that. It is very true. It's, uh, there's, the, the space is just not conducive to learning. It's certainly not conducive to um, very innovative use of technology in, these, in those classrooms. The, the whole building needs serious renovation, and of course, and when you go into this process with the, uh, if, if we submit an SOI this year, um, we will enter into a process where we decide what is really the 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 best alternative for what we need to do to address the uh, the functionality of this building. So. There are certainly some issues in the letter too around safety, and there there are things that we will address. And there's been issues around you know cleanliness. It's very hard when a building is this old to keep it at a, a, a level um, that you'd want it to be at. The the floors, um, the, if you look at the, uh, the floors throughout the entire school, you'll see chip tiles, and and um, and it's very hard at this point to really get you know, to have a good waxing that's going to, going to take. We have windows that don't work well. We have, it's, you, you just go down the list. It's, um, it's long. So we have to address uh, this. It, being put on warning means that if we do not address this, uh, we, we do um, run the risk of not being an accredited school. Now, what the timeline on that would be would, would probably take a number of years, but what they're looking for from us as a community is what is our plan to address some of these dire building needs. So that's sort of in a, a synopsis of what this letter is. As I said, it will be available for everyone to read, and um, we are going to have to address a number of the, the concerns expressed. Uh, first off, I'd like to commend uh, you and the staff for all the outstanding accommodations that were given. Uh, it was as we hoped that the negative, uh, the negative statements would be based on physical plant, and that's what came out. Uh, the, some of the things that are listed, and uh, the safety ones, do you see those being able to be addressed as soon as possible? I'm th concerned about the last two under the curriculum. Um, Do you, you mean the lack of fire blankets? Yeah, the blankets and the shutoffs in the, uh, uh, in the laboratory for the gas. Uh, I, I have a son that's a chemistry teacher, and it, it really brings that home. The answer is yes, and in fact, in some of the labs, we don't even use the, the gas any longer. The other question I have for you, will you be bringing uh, a budget of some, some sort to the, uh, the budget committee uh, to meet some of the other needs that we might be able to meet prior to total renovation uh, of the building for the upcoming year? Well, there are some things that are actually going to happen. Um, certainly the needs of this building, as all the buildings, are brought to capital, which is actually where uh, Ms. Johnson's at. And we have money already been allocated for the new boiler. 
Um, and once you, the, the, of course the process is that town meeting authorizes the money, but then by the time you order the materials, they, in this particular case, the boiler could be here in November and we could, imp, we could put it in. So we're investing in things. We've already invested in another boiler. We, we, are, we are investing in this building all the time because you have to. We can't uh, go another winter with um, the, the uncertainty of the boiler as we did last year. We really, we had days where we didn't have any heat and that's just not acceptable. Just one more. The, the major issue, more than half of the ones listed on the curriculum were the safety ones we were just talking about. If we have to close some of these labs, are, are we gonna be cutting back on some of the programs, the chemistry programs and things of this nature? How are we gonna address that if they, if they don't have the laboratories to, to utilize? Well, that's a very good question. Um, it certainly can impact the, the programs. It can certainly reduce the amount of actual labs that can be done. Now, not all labs that you deal with in chemistry involve um, gas. Certainly quite a few can and do. Um, but yes, of course it impacts the program. And that's what NIAS has been saying all along, is that the physical state of the building is impacting what's going on instructionally in the building. And if the building is not attended to, it's going to impact it more over the upcoming years. Thank you. Mr. Phil. I think it's important to understand that what Nias pointed out are some significant structural issues with the facility. The negative impact of the facility on the delivery of the school's written curriculum, the insufficient number and size of general classrooms and art rooms the layout and design of classrooms with columns and posts that limit students' vision and obstruct their movements, the insufficient science, size and design of science labs, the need for the increased availability of a full range of technology, the closure of a classroom due to environmental concerns, the falling of ceiling tiles, the presence of dust and lint and vents, the worn, broken, and poor condition of desks, tables, and lab supplies that are not up to current standards. So <clears throat> the, there may be a short-term answer to all this, and to some of this rather, some of the issues that are raised. But the only answer that would uh, satisfy the demands of the New England Association of Schools and Colleges is that the Arlington, the town of Arlington commence the process of, of, of uh, securing funds from the Massachusetts School Building Authority. I mean, it's pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. This compels us to begin the statement of interest in December, to file a statement of interest in, in December, to work our way through the MSBA process, which We've been through before. It's a good process. It's a time-consuming process. It starts with the uh, statement of interest. Then, if you're lucky, you get a feasibility study. You get authorized for a feasibility study. Town meeting has to appropriate money for that. And then at the end of the feasibility study process, we have different recommendations for uh, a building. My sense in reading all this and walking around this high school is that we're looking at long-term with the MSBA's participation and participation by the voters of Arlington, a renovation addition to this facility. That's the only way to address these issues here. It's not, it's not a, 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 a patch job. We're not talking about a patch job. We're talking about a renovation addition to this facility to meet these instructional needs of a high school in the 21st century. And historically, Dr. Jenger is right. It was 1991 or so, there was a study done of the high school that said we needed to build a new high school and we didn't do it for a lot of reasons. There were other priorities and, 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 now, and now it's past due. So the time has come to, to do something. So I see this report as um, saying, or this, this letter as saying that we have, we have a great high school that with fantastic uh, educators, uh, with a high quality teaching and learning going on in, in this building, which is something we can all be proud of in Arlington. And we have a physical structure that is impeding our continued success. And we have to take action. So I guess the, the, my, that's the statement. And my question is, is you know, I, I, and I think I know the answer, but I just wanna make sure the public hears it, is that you are in fact starting to marshal the information, the resources you need, the staff needs to write a letter of, uh, a statement of interest to the MSBA. Yes, the uh, process has begun, it began a, a while ago. It is a community decision. In fact, when you submit a statement of interest to MSBA, the school committee has to sign off on it, which 
I'm, I'm certain that will be the case, but the Board of Selectmen does as well. And the reason for that it is a community decision because once you begin that process, you have to have the commitment of all involved to follow that process through. And that what that will mean down the road is a commitment in a case of a high school to have a debt exclusion override. So it is a, as you, as you point out, because we've been through that together in the, in the Thompson, it is a process and it begins now. Um, I did talk with uh, the deputy director last week and they haven't set the time, the window yet for when, uh, when you submit. They think it probably be the same as last year, which be the window will be January to April. It's not a first come in, first served. It's um, simply um, based on the criteria they set up for the significance of your request in terms of urgency. And they have different criteria. Of course, Roman is the, 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 the situation here. This is, could, some people might say, well, is this advanced repair? It is beyond advanced repair. So our, our hope would be that we would certainly have this stand out. Last year they had 101 SOI submitted, of which they can only do a fraction um, because they have a limited amount of money based on the sales tax. But the Board of Selectmen, so the goal on my end of, is to have this done by the end of December so the political process can, can be done and we can get this in in that window that they're going to have. Yeah, just an important point that we all of us learned about the process the last time is you want to submit the statement of interest the first opportunity because we may have to wait because we may get told that you got to wait a year right. and, and, and you have to submit it again so you, you know first thing is we want a unanimous vote of the school committee and the board of selectmen to submit this to start the process mm -hmm. and then you know uh we went through the msba process last time for the thompson school and it was a new process for everybody in Arlington anyway, but it, it actually ended up being a very good process. There were lots of checks and balances along the way. There was lots of participation by town meeting, the Board of Selectmen, the Capital Planning Committee, the Finance Committee. Lots of people had a chance to weigh in on the, the, the scope and design and, and cost of that building that we built. And so I think we're about to begin, hopefully with unanimous support from everybody in leadership in the town, a very uh, uh, thoughtful, uh, process with a lot of community involvement, a lot of participation, and at the end of the day, we have the chance, if we do this right, to build or to rebuild or create a great facility that can educate thousands of kids over time and be a great place for learning. Mr. Schlickman. Um, yeah, I, I want to reiterate what, what was said and, in fact, take it to another level. One of my more thoughtful, cautious, and conservative friends uh, it started pushing me for data about the high school. And I looked at him and said, we are at risk of losing our accreditation if we don't make substantive changes to the facility. Well, that's sufficient data. Uh, what do you intend to do? That becomes another tricky question because well, people who have been associated with town government for a long time do remember what the old rules were with the old uh, building authority, that you came up with a plan, you came up with drawings, you got it on the list, and you worked with it that way. And the partnership has changed. We need to go to the state and say, this is the problem we have. Mm -hmm. They want to have a seat at the table to develop the fix. So we cannot develop our fix and present it to the state. Right. We can only say we have needs, and these are the needs, and we need your help to work them out. So we're not going to be going to the community with a solution. We're not going to go with drawings. We're not going to go with a plan. We're going with a series of problems to the state because they are going to give us half the money for this project. And that's the way it's going to work. It may be unsatisfying at this point to not have the answers to present to the public. We're not going to have that until we actually engage in the conversation with the state. But we do have substantive, significant, and severe needs to improve this facility and to make substantive improvements over the next 10 years, or we do risk losing our accreditation. I just wanted to point out that 
although they have a long list of th of needs that the high school has, they don't even hit everything. And for example, one thing that I know that a renovation could potentially bring to us is increased safe student and staff safety mm -hmm. that we've been mm -hmm. um, discussing with all the recent spate of various gun issues. And this would give us a chance to build more safety into the stru physical structure of the school. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not just what's on this list. We may be bringing in things that we realize are needs that even though NEASC didn't mention them, they're still big, real, and would be hit with a renovation. Mm -hmm. I just want to comment on the process. Uh, uh, both Mr. Thill and Mr. Slickman really um, described it well. It is a different process. For those of us that went through the old ones, which I was one of those people, it was very different, and you're learning a different way of going about it. We do not go with the solution. In fact, that's what the feasibility study is all about. Um, so the SOI is presenting the, the needs and the problems, and they're going to be in terms of the physical plant, and we've already engaged um, an outside engineering company to do a full analysis of all of our mechanical and electrical systems. And that report isn't uh, completely finished yet. We will be doing an, an enrollment study, and of course, that, that's going to be looking at where this building is going to be 10 years from now, because this, we won't, might not even begin construction for several years um, or whatever we end up doing. Um, and what is that going to look, look like 20 years out in terms of projections as best as we can uh, to say? And then there's the educational piece. And um, uh, Dr. Janger and I talked about that. And in fact, we talked about it with a group of teachers as well just the other day that it's hard to have entirely a crystal ball on what's what we're going to be our schools are going to be in the in the future but clearly one thing that they are going to be is there's going to be a lot more collaborative learning um, and needs for places where students can do this uh, we're going to see much more of the type of thing that we're already doing in Arlington High School which are internships and coming back and doing presentations not to a class of 30, but to a class, you know, groups of 50 and 100, and we don't really have that type. So when we're thinking, and that was what I talked with the teachers about, what I want them to be thinking about is if, if the facility were to change, I could do X, Y, and Z, or I am prevented from doing what, what I think is good education because I don't have, you know, the A, B, and C type of thing. So that's where they're thinking, and that's what you present uh, to the MSBA is what all of these areas of need are. And that's what we did with Thompson. We talked about the educational impact. We talked about enrollment impact. We talked about the physical building. Um, those are the three main areas. And of course, as, as you say, safety and security and all of those things are very important as well. And that's been a big issue here at this, at this school. Um, so it's, it's going to be quite a project, um, but I, I feel, I, and, I, and I do believe that the teachers feel very positive. They feel positive after getting the report came out, and I think they feel positive after having a chance this week to read the letter and have discussions themselves that it's, you know, they are doing a very good job. And uh, our students are doing a very good job, and they deserve a building that reflects what a great job they're doing and help them become better at what they do. Thank you very much for, for laying that out uh, for us and for the public. Um, <coughs> we have another, another very uh, important discussion to take up right now having to do with a very recent, recent report, uh, the MCAS highlights and accountability reports. Um, I would. I would. By the way, let me just start this by saying that I've had a lot of emails this week after sending notices both about accountability and, and MCAS highlights with parents asking, when are we going to get the individual report cards? And I've answered a lot of them, but I think principals are going to address this as well. I don't think that you will get them until at least the end of next week. And the reason why is that they come into the schools 
um, into the, my office. They have to be sorted by school. They're at the schools now. They all have to be put in envelopes, labeled, and then they all go to our central distribution place at Town Hall. That has to get delivered to Waltham, and then, then they'll get mailed. So it's a, it's a process, mm -hmm. and that's where it is. So um, uh, I would expect the end of next week, Friday, Saturday, possibly, depending on how well your mail gets to your house, maybe even Monday. So I just need to say that up front, because I know there's been a high interest in that issue. Um, as part of the state testing that um, we have been engaged in now, I think it's close to 15 years, and potentially will be changing uh, in the next year or two, the, the, um, we, have, we have been following very closely our students' uh, progress both uh, from d different vantage points. Certainly, vantage point of you know their their improvement in terms of the content knowledge, their performance on the assessments. We look we look at it in terms of um, our high needs groups, and and until recently we were looking at and not not that we're not still, but um, we look at different different demographic or. Um, uh, racial, ethnic breakdowns in terms of how students are doing. ELL students, special education students, and look at those different groups. What has happened in the last year or so, we now have we've taken all of these groups which we have individually looked at be, and, and put them into one subgroup, which is called a high needs group. What well, the accountability reports are looking at, it's a, it's a new way of looking at progress to narrowing the achievement gap in schools. Um, there used to be a measure called AYP. We no longer talk about AYP, we talk about PPIs. And I think that a lot of people have been sort of lost in this changeover. And before we actually start talking about numbers and, and, this, and this kind of information, I, I'd ask Dr. Chesson if she would just um, do a brief overview, which we did with all the administrators the other uh, last week, about what where these numbers come from and what are the significance of the numbers and how they affect the accountability reports. I know that quite a few of you here at the table are steeped in this yourself, mm -hmm. but I do think that when we talk about these acronyms and uh, that people who are listening to this really don't understand entirely what we're talking about. So that's why we're going to precede the, the looking at our our district data and uh, with this little introduction. Um, I'm not going to go into a, a great deal of um, detail. Um, all the information that I'm showing is available on the Department of Education website. But we wanted our principals to make sure that they were all in the same place so that they could look at their reports and better understand them. And this is what we showed them last week. And as Dr. Bodhi just mentioned, um, we used to have a framework called AYP, and now in, under the new Massachusetts Framework for Accountability and Assistance, schools are rated on a scale from one to five, which 80, were 80% 80 of the students' uh, schools are in uh, level one and level two. Um, level three um, is where you know, schools really need to start to take a look at where they um, need to make a changes and four and five are the, those type of districts that you often hear about a possibility of the school, I'm sorry, schools that are um, possibly going to be taken over by the state or at least under consideration for being taken over by the state. So under the old system, um, the goal was for 100% of students to score proficient or advanced by 2017 um, on the MCAS test. And under the new system, uh, the goal is for a district to cut their proficiency gap. And one second, I'll talk about what that is. So if you look at this chart, it demonstrates that um, in ELA and math from 2001 uh, originally to 2013, and actually at one point in my career, I believe it was 2010, um, all districts were supposed to go from uh, where, where they started in 2001 to 100% um, proficient and advanced um, by the 2013 school year. That was under the old system. 
But we've had some major changes in 2012, um, and that was that the old um, goal was to re uh, was replaced by cutting the proficiency gap in half by 2017. Um, so uh, NCLB uh, accountability status labels were replaced by the states one through five. AYP is replaced by the new performance measure called the Progress and Performance Index, or PPI, and that incorporates measures of uh, student growth um, in ELA, and it also included science, which the previous measure did not, and it also included some other indicators at the high school level, uh, such as graduation rate and dropout rate. So what are, are some of the key concepts? It's a measure of measuring progress towards a group's uh, gap narrowing goals. There's an annual PPI that shows progress over two years and a cumulative PPI that represents a trend over time. There are core indicators and there can be up to seven that uh, high schools have seven and elementary and middle schools would not have the last two here. So uh, we take into account ELA, math, science, proficiency gap and that proficiency gap is um, the difference between 100% of your students being at proficient advanced and where you began at the target year. So if you're tar the first year the, that we started this, you had 75% of your students that were proficient in advanced, then the difference between 100% and 75% would be 25%, and your goal by 2017 would be to half that or have an increase of 12.5%. It also looks at ELA and math growth. We often refer to this as SGP or student growth. Um, and at the high school level, as I said before, it's gonna look also, you're also gonna get points based on, or, or not get points, based on your annual dropout rate and your cohort graduation rate for your four and five year. There's also extra credit if you reduce the percentage of your students scoring warning and, or failing, or if you increase the percentage of your students um, that are scoring advanced. And so if you increase your um, students that are scoring advanced by 10% or more from the previous year, or if you decrease the percentage of your students scoring warning or advanced from the previous year by 10%, then you get some additional uh, points. And PPI, when they finish calculating it, runs from zero to 100, and 75 is said to be on target. It's quite a complicated um, uh, calculation, but just to give you an idea, so you have your core indicators, your, whether you're closing your proficiency gap in ELA and your target would be 75 points, whether you're closing your proficiency gap um, in math, again, 75 points, same thing for science, whether you're getting an ELA growth of 51 or better, which would be a, a 75 points would be given, same thing for math and wh what your annual dropout rate and your cohort rate is. And as you can see, you can get extra points if you increase the students that are advanced or if you decrease the students that are warning failing. This is a, a sample report and you'll see that, um, and these are the reports that we gave out to all our principals last week and they're available for every school on the Department of Education website. So if you wanna look up a particular school, but um, one of the most important things here is the state has added more information on the first layer of the report. So this school, this is just a sample school. You can see that it's level one school and it shows that it's meeting the gap, narrowing the goals. You can see um, what um, it's, all, it's all students PPI is, which is right here, the 100. Um, you'll see that the high need students PPI is 78. And then, um, although some documents do refer to the subgroups um, of being at least 10, if uh, in the document that was released on 826 by the State Department of Education um, says uh, that you m actually must have um, 30 students or more in a specific subgroup um, in order to have a calculation based on that. So sometimes you'll see the number 10, but actually the document they released on 826 said that number significantly higher. So if you don't have enough students that fall into that category, then you will not see a separate number for that student. So in this it, it exist, uh, example here, it does not mean that the school does not have any ELL students or low income students, but rather it means that, it, it, they, and that may be the case, but it also may the ca be the case that it just doesn't have enough students to report that. And then, again, uh, on the bottom here, you'll see 
that this school, um, that their annual PPI and their cumulative PPI and what their target was. So this would be a school that would be a level one school. And then there's a third layer of the report that goes into greater detail. If the school was a level two school, you'll see that this says level two and it tells you um, the reason why this school, or one of the reasons why this school is not um, a level one school. And in this case, it says that it's not meeting the gap, narrowing the goals. And if you look down below, you'll see for all students, the number is 72. For high need students, it's 40. For low income, 41. And students with disability, it's 29. So you'll see that that, that did not meet the target of 75. For a level three school, which is a, um, a, this says that this one is among the lowest performing 20% of the schools, there are a variety of reasons that a school could be um, given a level three designation. And one of the designation rules is that if 90% of, or less than 90% of the students on the report, it will say that less than 90% of the students um, participate in the MCAS. If you unlayer that, in some cases, it's really not talking about the participation of MCAS, but it's talking, if they're ELL students, it's actually talking about their participation rate in the access test, which is the ELA student, ELL student test um, that's also given by the Department of Education. That makes sense. And uh, this slide just shows some resources and documents. There are a number of small videos um, on the State Department of Education website that go into more detail on PPI and some, several of the, uh, other of the measures. And uh, you can certainly take a look at those. Actually does a really good job talking about it in plain English, I think. Okay. Thank you. That was very helpful. I don't see any questions. That, uh, what I wanted to get across for people listening is that it's a very complex formula, which is trying to measure <coughs> your progress in meeting a target, and the target is um, mathematically determined by how, how much progress you have to make toward a particular goal, so essentially it. You could make, in fact, we, this is a case in a number of our schools, they've made the target with the aggregate, means all the students in there quite well, they'd be in the 80s. But even if they had a 74 or a 72 on their high needs group, which is all of the subgroups in one group, they would not be able to be a level one school. They would be a level two school. And I know that it's it would be possible that you could have every school in the district be a level one school and in another, in, in your last school could be a level one by meeting their target by the aggregate, but if they miss it by one point, they could not. They could be a level two school, then, which means that the whole district is level two. So you, your district level is by your lowest level of any subgroup, or aggregate group. So that's how it works. And I, Laura is correct that there is some video. There's videos you, uh, on the website there that really, if you people really want to get into understanding it more. As a district, um, we, uh, is a, I sent out a press release last week uh, talking about what had happened vis-a-vis -vis, uh, coding error that had happened last year. And Laura was talking about the participation rate. That's what happened at Audison. The participation rate on the access test went below the 90%, which then triggered um, a level three. Um, that, that appeal has been made. Um, in fact, even the Department of Education said had but that happened, that would have been a level two. Our schools in the district are level <coughs> one or level two um, until every school um, and every, every high needs subgroup in every school uh, attains their target, th th um, we will not be a level one district. We, um, I think that the quality of teaching that goes on in this district this is definitely a level one district, and that is a goal that we have to be able to demonstrate that. And um, so we've talked a lot about that, and people are digging into the data very carefully, uh, and there's a lot of data. And you have to think about also what is the best leverage in terms of what you really need to be focusing on. And, as, and I go back really to what Dr. Janger was saying. I think that you can get lost sometimes in these numbers, 
but you have to really step back and say, what is really important to know? And some of that's determined by what the Common Core standards are and making sure that the curriculum that you're, you're um, providing is aligned with that and then understanding whether they're really learning it. And that's, in a simple terms, what we are really focusing on as a, as a district. But um, each, each um, school will have an account uh, accountability report card and um, you, have, you have those report cards for each school with all of the, the, the you've got the layer two and you've got the layer, layer three data. And, and as I said, each school is looking very carefully at this. Um, so before we move on to MCAS highlights, I thought maybe we'd just stay with this issue of accountability um, in terms of the, from again, the 30,000 feet on this, we have four of our schools which are level one and they are the, the Bishop, Brackett, Dallin, and Hardy schools. And then um, all of our other schools but Addison are level two. But if you look, when you actually get into the data, you'll see how close it would be. So for example, Thompson. In the aggregate, they were um, 85, well making the target, but for um, the high needs group, it's 71. So it's it's, you know, they were very close. I, I just want to say that the, the, the score that you're talking about for the Thompson, that they've got a 71 uh, where they need a 75, that's a rolling four-year average. And the most recent year is 40% of that rolling average. The previous year is 30. The, pre the year before that is 20. The year before that is 10. Now, the fact is, is that uh, this year the Thompson got an 81. That's 40% of the score. It's getting really hurt by their 2010 score, which was a 19. That will fall off next year. And it's very conceivable that the Thompson will uh, come in with uh, the 73 that they need to be a, a level one school for high needs next year. In fact, the way I look at it, most of the schools this year made progress. A couple didn't. Uh, and I, I'd say that uh, all of the level two schools, except one, are mathematically very capable of hitting level one next year. So um, we're in a better shape this year than we were last year, and, and there's been progress made. And I know that uh, from my experience of looking into this last year and the work that has been done is that the school department's taking this seriously and targeting the areas that, that require help. Uh, so it's a, you know, on bulk a, a good, good year for, for test scores from Arlington. Re remembering one thing, that the test score is not a goal. Nobody's dropping the kid off the first day of school saying, gee, I hope the kid does well. And MCAS, you know, it's like they hope the kid gets to Harvard or MIT. It's, it's a different thing. But this is just an indicator and it measures something. Uh, the PPI scores, I think, are a much better indicator of school quality and issues than the old CPI. I think it gives us a pretty clear picture and a direction, and this year's direction has been moving forward. Thank you. Mr. Thielman. I, I don't know if this question is probably not, but it isn't. Just, but what, I just, could you speak to what the strategies are to um, support Teachers where, where their MCAS scores might not have been where you wanted them to be or uh, individual buildings or, or even, even strategies that might be being used to help various subgroups. I mean, is there, is there kind of an overall global strategy to address any areas where there's weaknesses? Well, we'll certainly uh, go into greater detail on that in two weeks when we present the okay. full report on MCAS results. But uh, let me just briefly say that there's been a, a significant increase in the support that teachers have been given this year in terms of the uh, math coaches that we now have in the schools, that we've changed our uh, what we used to be former reading coaches into literacy coaches. Um, we spent a great deal of time this summer with those teachers working with those coaches, and we already have been uh, already this year working with them and the amount of data that we're allowing teachers to get access to um, and we and we hope that we will be able to continue to increase our ability to be out, able for teachers to get access to their student data and be able to analyze it and really react to it as quickly as possible um, that's something that we're hopefully bringing um, forward in terms of a, a budget need to the capital uh, committee um, I think those things are, will be the things that will lead us forward to what Mr. Slickman is talking about. Good, because I mean, I think 
the, 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 you know, I think at our level, the school board level, you, you look at, is it a level one school, level two school, you look at the MCAS scores, you look at rankings and all that stuff. And I think, it, I think it's certainly important for expressing to the general public how our school district is doing. But the, one I, the things I always think about is, like, what about those kids who got needs improvement? What about those kids who are on warning? What about those kids in the subgroups? Right. Right. And, and, I'm, and I think that's, mm -hmm. you know, that's, I mean, I'm glad, I'm, thank you for your comment, Dr. Chesson, because I think you just, you don't want to get lost. You don't want to get lost in the numbers and get lost in the celebration of a, of a school or a grade that did really well and is top in the state. You want to think about those kids that struggle and what we're doing to help them. Anecdotally, um, one of one elementary teacher in a school that level one and did very well. I said, you know, just saying just the other day to her, her principal saying, um, what can we do better? And I think that that sort of speaks to it all. It's like people really want to understand what they can do better. And I, and I, and honestly, unless you really take the time to go into the de the data and really look at it. Um, sometimes you don't know. You, you don't. You. Uh, it's important to get at that into the level of actually what types of understandings don't our students have, and so to that extent, um, I think that what we're doing with um, our district determined measures and what we've been doing with common assessments, I think, is another step forward, because. Um, we're looking at common assessments a little bit differently and looking at where the progress is from one assessment to another in terms of key concepts. And we've always, we've not always, but we've had for a long time common assessments, but it, I think that little piece has been missing that this is really going to help, help with. Um, and making sure that you understand very clearly what are the outcomes you want in terms of student learning at the end of the year. And uh, there's a lot of wonderful things, um, and we want to be exposed to our, our students. We don't want to give up on important things like art and music, and and uh, we don't want to do that because it, you don't want, again not be lost in the numbers and be trying to go to a test. But we're trying to educate a whole child, and 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 also providing the contextual experience of lots of things that that help you, you know, help us grow as human beings. And so it's balancing all of that in what I might add has a day that has not increased at all in terms of time. And uh, teachers that are working very hard and not have enough time to spend together doing this. So within these constraints and not as an excuse, trying to do the very best they can with, with all of that. Thank you. Ms. Hine? Um, just looking through the preliminary data that that first level, it's always um, clear how the schools do have varying populations. Mm -hmm. And I know that we spent a lot of time and energy to bring certain programs back into the town so that our students did not have to um, travel to other communities to get certain academic programs. And because of our um, student population, those programs aren't always in every school equally. Is there um, any sort of um, separation in terms of whether those programs are disproportionately affecting any of the school's level appearance. So I'm not saying this well, but um, what the what the core class experience is for the majority of our students might be a little bit different than what perhaps one of our special academic programs that we've set up for smaller populations might be. And are we taking that into account? How are we taking that into account as we look at the individual schools reporting? Well, I'd answer that a, a few ways. Our belief has been in practice over the last few years is trying to be much more attentive to the curriculum that's taught in our substantially separate programs to have it align um, with the curriculum that's going on in, in our general education classes, Provide, inviting those special educators to our professional development. When we, when we buy materials, we buy materials for, the, for those classes as well. Yes, some of the materials have to be um, um, certainly modified for the population there. Um, when, when appropriate, we do all, alternative uh, 
MCAS, and I know you, you probably, probably in your school you do as well, and so those have a different point effect on your scores. And yes, they, they, they do, but they, they can have an effect. Um, certainly they can have an effect on your, um, your high need score. On the other hand, it's a question of progress. And it's the, what's nice, nicer about these PPI scores is that they're not, so, they're not that linear, you've got to get to 100% by a certain date, which was sort of a, a very right. silly notion, to be honest. Um, but this is a different way of, of approaching it. So yes, it, it can have an effect. Um, and, um, but does that mean that we don't have a program in a particular school? No, and everybody that, that's in a particular school embraces having that program there and, in fact, would not want the program to leave. So I'm not sure I entirely um, hit what actually, you're trying to get at. And my implication wasn't that we would want these programs to be anywhere else, but um, I know, for instance, that there was um, a program that we had in the bracket that doesn't exist in the bishop. And when I look at our scores, there are some categories that the bracket or the Odyssey have reported on that the bishop doesn't. Right. And so, um, and it's not that the bracket is really anything perhaps different than what the bishop is providing in that general ed setting. So I'm wondering, as a parent looks at these ratings, like level one, level two, there might be the assumption that there is something different for in the general classroom when perhaps there isn't bit when you look at the whole building. And so I'm just wondering how that gets taken into account in terms of when, when we do look at these ratings mm -hmm. and how that gets communicated as well. Well, I think you've done a very nice job of communicating <laughs> that, <laughs> of what, the, what some of the issues are. And, and, and it's, it's a very delicate thing to talk about because um, it's both being very honest about it and at the same time um, not wanting to have any kind of, you know, offsetting of one group versus another group. We, we see them as a school and we see them, we, we try to, to the extent possible, include these students in, in classes. Um, and I think from the point of view, and I've heard this over and over again from parents, these students are our students, this is our school. And yes, there can be, um, there can be an effect. And, but I, I don't think, I, right now, without sitting down and actually going through it mathematically, I don't think I could answer it beyond that at this moment. Okay, thank you. Anyone else with questions? Mm -hmm. Mr. Hanna. You, did I hear you right saying that there's going to be a more complete NCAS yes. report? Mm -hmm. And you'll be sharing, one of our concerns in the past has been the uh, middle school math, so that'll, you'll be talking about that? Absolutely. Oh, we, we will, it's been as okay. high on our part. We're gonna get into more of it, what, but it's, it's all public, it came out publicly last Friday. It's important, I think, to acknowledge where we are in terms of our accountability status of our district, of each school. And also for the highlights. I mean, I, I think there's a lot to be proud of here. Does that mean that there's things we don't need to work on? No. I mean, there's, I, I can think of a couple areas right now where, where I know we need to have some focus, and I know they're already focusing on them. When I say they, I, I'm talking about uh, 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 you know, our math coaches. So, but at the same time, I think that um, it's important for people to have a sense of pride about the progress that has been made. And I think there were some notable things this year that happened that um, I really want to, you know, I'll put it certainly in the press release. But for example, um, you know, we have a school, um, Hardy, who was number one in ELA in fifth grade across the Commonwealth. I mean, that is really says a lot. And, um, and as I was saying to my email to the staff about all this, when those students were in fourth grade, they were in blended classes. And, and, and our, when we had our fifth grade at Bishop, they were in blended classes the year before. And there's a lot of kudos to the, to the quality of teaching. And I think that that's a really important message. I know that what it says to me is that 
what we have district wide are just qual really high quality teaching that goes on and it doesn't it, it really there's different challenges with different groups as you were alluding to but the quality of teaching is is uniform in all of our schools and I think that these results sort of bear that out quite quite well but you know that's quite a substantial accomplishment to have a hundred percent proficiency and because uh, we're talking about over 900 schools in the Commonwealth so there are a lot of that and you go through the percentages and, and um, that were in that press release um, there are a lot of a lot of schools was this did I give the report on every single grade every single subject no that wasn't the point of it, it was the highlights um, are we looking at all of that data? Absolutely. And looking at issues, um, trends that might um, occur that we need to take a look at. And, you know, some things have popped out right away that we need to take a look at, and we will. And, and that's what um, Dr. Cheston is going to spend more time on when we, we, you know, give you a more complete report. Dr. Allison, I just had a couple questions for mechanics of the test, um, the report. So am I understanding correctly that they changed the number of minimum number of students to report out a subgroup? According to the August 26th document that came out from the state, in order to have a subgroup reported, you must have 30 students in that subgroup. Okay, because I think it was 10 before. I no. know, and I, I know okay. that Mr. Um, Hainer and I actually looked at it tonight, and, he and I actually went back and checked that. Yeah. And when I spoke to the State Department of Education earlier this week several times, I verified that that number is, in fact, 30. Okay. For the for for the so, calculation that determines the level of the the school. Right. So that's why we don't have nearly as much subgroup data. This that's time correct. As last time. Um, and second, I'm seeing things called extra credit, and I'm yes. wondering what extra credit is. If a, if you reduce the number of students that uh, the percentage of students that are fa failing or warning, it's called failing at the high school level and warning at all the other levels by 10 percent, you can get extra points if you reduce if you increase the number of students that uh, score at the advanced level by 10 more than 10 percent or more you may get extra points okay thank you just for clarification on that number is the the 30 is going forward for subgroups because i'm looking right at the DES, dese website and reporting for 13 it says Achievement level percentages are not calculated for groups with fewer than 10 students. I understand that, but there was I, a I mean, I'm just asking, is that 30 going forward starting this year, or is it unclear? I, I, all I can tell you is that of the document that's dated 8-26-2013, it says um, that you must have 30 students in a subgroup. It says, if a particular student group does not meet the minimum size, 20 students for all students group or 30 for sub students in a given subgroup, the PPI will not be reported for that group. That's okay. what it says. I'm, I'm not contending, but um, maybe the, it, Maybe you, it's it talking says, about another measure. Well, they said... Uh, Mr. Schlickman, Mr. I think, Schlickman wants might to... Have the answer. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, if you go to the profiles under assessment, they will calculate out to 10. If for the accountability purposes... Uh, for PPI, the threshold's 30. So they, they do different rules in different places. Right, excellent. Okay. Thank you. Any, there it is. With with foot, no, Paul. <clears throat> I won't argue with him. <laughs> he knows his stuff. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Chesson, Dr. Bodie. Thanks for leading us through those highlights. And, and I must say that I'm extremely proud of that, uh, that designation for the Hardy and some of the other men. Uh, oh, right. so. many, many, <clears throat> and that's why it was important to put it out for yes. people to see this. Okay, another um, bit of good news happened about a week or so ago, right? The opening and the special ribbon cutting of the Thompson Elementary School. Mm -hmm. um, it was a fantastic Sunday. It was. Oh. It was wonderful, and uh, so many people came. It was standing room in the gym. Uh, where, which is our gym auditorium. And uh, I think people were just, there was being pleased and happy on so many levels. So people have wanted this project for a long time and it's been a dream. And Ms. Foley is here and she knows, she lives it every day. I mean, you might want to ask her a little bit about her experience at Thompson this year. Dr. I'll give her a chance. Could you uh, pan the mic over a little bit? And, uh, up to 
Uh, it, it's been wonderful. I mean, it's just, as soon as you walk into the school, it's, um, it's just an incredible feeling. And um, the students feel it, the staff feels it, everyone who just walks into the building feels it. And just being in there all the time, it's, um, it's a much quieter building than the old one, I, that's for sure. I mean, our kids are no less, no less noisy. Um, but when we, there's, there's something about the acoustics and how it's been constructed that it minimizes the noise. Um, we're all wearing the microphones um, that we have for the classrooms, and I will admit I was resisting those at first because I have a rather powerful voice, and as I said to my colleagues, you really don't want to hear me amplified. Um, but actually, it's wonderful because I can talk in a very normal voice, um, and every single kid in the room, their, their head just snaps right to attention as soon as I just talk in my, my regular voice. It's fantastic. Um, the technology, we're, we're getting the iPads out. The kids are super excited about them, but they're starting to learn that they are a learning tool, not a toy. Um, and that's happening in all the classrooms, and it's just, yeah, it's fantastic. Thank you to ev absolutely everyone who worked on that committee It was, and to work for this dream because it really is absolutely wonderful. And the ribbon cutting was fantastic. Awesome. Awesome. And our, our fifth grade student did a, a great job. So it, it was a wonderful event and we have another wonderful event coming up. Um, and that is the dedication of the library which you all supported uh, for Mr. Bill Shea who it was those of you who worked with him and knew him is just a wonderful person. Um, energetic is an understatement, but pa and passionate um, about being of service to make Arlington a better community, particularly our schools, better schools. Um, we are having a, the dedication ceremony this coming Sunday. It's from two to four, and so if you didn't have an opportunity to come and visit the school at the ribbon cutting, the school is open during that time period and you're most welcome to come. Um, we are going to have um, an, an author, Mr. Peter Reynolds, who's going to uh, have a book signing and, and talk um, about the work that he's done as, as an author. And the teachers at Thompson have volunteered to come and, and run different uh, sessions in different rooms on literacy. And, and I know I, some of them sound really fantastic. And so that will be going on in the building for the children, and, and there will be also an event in the library. But preceding all of that, we will have another opportunity for um, some presentations, some uh, thank yous, uh, some people who've, who've known Bill his, his, uh, for a long time are going to be speaking as well. It, we're designing the program not to be a long program, but nonetheless um, a very fitting program for the contributions he's made and for what such, such a wonderful human being he, he, um, he was and such an example to us all. So that, then there's going to be refreshments and then uh, opportunity to go to these events and even to tour the building. So uh, please join us on, uh, on Sunday. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask you to <laughs> stay on the. Stay there. Stay here. Uh, you've got a superintendent's report coming up and, and some, some goal setting agendas for this coming year that you'd like to speak to us about. Well, yeah, let me. Um, well, why don't I start with that? Okay. Um, We've spent some time here at the table. Let me just put this in context a little bit. We're, we've begun a new educator evaluation system that throughout, throughout the, the, the entire structure of a school district. Um, and in that process, it, it is a process in which um, individuals are really looking at their own practice or looking at their goals and setting goals for that year and as the year unfolds to be looking at how what progress is being made and so the process is one of trying to have it be a much more reflective and not that people haven't had goals in the past teachers always do they'll start the year saying I want to do this this year or I want my children to know that better that always happens but this is a little bit more formalized in terms of um, what we're going to be doing with with goal setting so We've talked a bit about that, and we're going to talk more about it this year as we go on. Um, in fact, this last Tuesday, uh, 
teachers met to learn a little bit about the technology that we're using for this, but also to have some time just to, to work on their own goals. So this is true with teachers, with administrators, with central office people. We're all in the process of developing um, goals for this year. And um, I am as well. For um, superintendents, it's the process a little bit different just because there's not just one, one supervisor, there's a whole committee of people. And th then there's also some in, in limitations as to um, what types of observations you can, you can make. So having said all that, there, it's a little bit different, but nonetheless, the, the idea is the same. So there is a goal around practice and, and one about student achievement. And the Department of Education has also suggested looking at district goals. I will say this, and, and that Arlington has been a bit, a bit ahead of the curve in terms of the school committee and, and superintendent evaluation, because we have been doing that for a long time, um, looking at goals, um, evidence of success. And as Mr. Stillman, I know there used to be a point system with this. <laughs> we've <laughs> moved beyond. We've evolved. We've evolved to a new. I don't like it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> we've evolved. But the idea is the same. Is you know, you, you want to set some goals. You want them to be. Uh, things that you want to do, but sometimes some challenge, you may not completely get there, and maybe something that goes on for a while. So we've been doing that. So I, I don't see that we're, we're markedly different, but I have sp specific ones. And with respect to um, a practice, it's actually, my, my goal is actually very, very much in line with um, the goal that we're doing as administrators throughout the whole district. As we work together um, to have a, a common language, a common um, perceptions about what we see as really quality teaching, we're working together to make sure that our understanding of what, the, um, what good instruction is in a classroom, we, we would agree. Because I think that one of the concerns, and, and, and I don't think actually in Arlington it's, it's a huge one, but it is, nonetheless it's there. As we go through this, there's concern that you know you get the easy grader, this, this, the, the grader that's a little bit harder as you go through this. And so we're trying to work on that, that we, we have commonalities. And so we have a team goal this year, and one of the things that we're doing, um, uh, there's a, a number of things that we're doing, but one of them is, is practice rounds where we will be going in small teams around to different classrooms just to, to debrief about our own thinking about um, what we're, we're seeing. And so my, one of my practice goals is participating in that, in which I will be, and, and, I, and I do this anyway, but it'll be a little bit more formalized, a little bit more um, accountable in terms of the number that get done, you know, you know, so I didn't, you know, maybe didn't get to all three last year with a particular principal. This year I will be getting to, to all three of those kinds of practice rounds. So that's the, the nature of, that, of this particular goal. And there's, in, in the format, the, we've already talked about this as a, as a group, you know, there's key actions and then benchmarks that go with, with the achievement of that. And what I've done in the, uh, the, format of this goal is, is actually relaying this to what are the, um, the standards that are expected of superintendents and the rubrics involved in that, uh, that evaluation, and also what are our district goals. And certainly one of our district goals um, around evaluation is implementing this new eva educator evaluation system this year, and this is just um, one aspect of it. So that's the area of the practice. With respect to student achievement, um, my overall goal is that our MCAS 2014 in the aggregate will be improved um, and at each grade level tested when we go through the next t testing cycle. And there are a lot of things that we have put into place and we'll talk more about them as the year goes on and actually people come in to talk about it in ways that we are going to um, be more leveraged, more, more strategic, more um, prepared um, for uh, helping our students succeed on these, uh, these assessments, which are important. It doesn't mean it's the only thing that's important in education, but to say that they're not is, is not quite accurate. 
So that is uh, the achievement goal. And in terms of the district goal, and we have a lot of district goals. They've come down from where we were a few years ago where we may have 40. But one of the ones that's really important to all of us in moving again forward in helping teachers and helping ourselves uh, improve is, is implementing these district determined measures. I t mentioned that earlier and looking at, uh, you know, we set a baseline in our own assessments and then looking at student progress through the year. And so uh, mm -hmm. the district goal has to do with the implementation uh, and pilot of those district determined measures. So those are, those are the, the areas, and, and I, there's no action, as I mentioned, to it really needs to be tonight. I, I think that it's one of those things that might be referred to subgroup in terms of more timeline inf issues or some vetting of the evidence you want to see, that type of thing, but um, that's the nature of it. So I, want, so I think it's important for people listening to know that this process that we're going through with all teachers and administrators is also going, it is happening uh, with me as well. Any questions for the superintendent on this? Doc, oh, Dr. Allison Ampey. Did we want to make a formal motion for the policy? Or to, to be referred to a policies and procedures meeting? In yeah. The, in the near future? Or, um, sure. I'll wasn't, be happy I'll, to accept the motion. I'll second it for the purposes of discussion. It, Did you make that? I wasn't. Oh. I was asking because it sort of was out there whether we needed to, I mean, do you want to just take it up or do you want a motion? We can just take it up, but um, what are we taking up? <laughs> yep. what, what, what do you want to take up? The, what, at, what set of ev evidence is you should present? Yeah, what set of evidence um, do we want to, what do we want to do with all the other district goals in terms of evidence as well? And, um, you know, sort of a re uh, reporting out of the, when we're working with teachers and administrators, they're going to be a, for, a formative time too, is looking at it. Now, in our discussion, what it might make more sense, and Mr. a number of you suggested, Mr. Hayner as well, that we, you know, label each different presentation or th something comes in, how it relates back to any of these, and label it very clearly so you know. So we're, we're all going to be learning as we go through this this year, and um, we'll probably tweak it a little bit better next year. I don't know if, if it should go, it is a policy eventually, but I would, I would suggest to the committee for the purpose of discussion, make a unique group to work with Dr. Bodie to get this done and then if, when it's done, bring it to policy rather than take policy's time with all the other things that are going on. This is something that we've been trying to hammer out for the past four or five months and uh, just a thought, to take it off to the side and eventually it, does, it belongs with policy, there's no question on that. Whatever you want to do, <clears throat> whatever you want to do. So um, why don't I, I like that piece of opinion? I, I think policies does have a lot on its plate right now. I I'd, I'd like to make a motion that um, a special um, sort of study group or a subcommittee wor uh, work with the superintendent this year on. Um, Process and the and and the <coughs> evidence uh, required for uh, the superintendent's annual educator plan. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those against? Okay. So, special subcommittee has Who's been created be for that, that purpose. I'll, I'll be happy we to work. Need to create. Create a, a leader on uh, or two. Well, we just uh, need to create the special committee. A couple of people to work with. Would about. any volunteers like to? Okay, Ms. Heim, I see. Mr. Schlickman, Ms. Starks, and you're already yeah. so busy. Can I can't I do four, right? Can I do four? No. Just can't three. do four. No, three. 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 Okay. So, Ms. Heim, Mr. Schlickman, Ms. Starks, you can Fine. come and visit. Back okay. up. I'll, <laughs> I'll visit. Great. All right. Thank you. Uh, Superintendent's report. Oh. Just a few things. We're talking a lot tonight. Um, I want to compliment and uh, the performing arts department at the high school, particularly the jazz band and the magical singers. They were amazing on town day once again. And it's particularly so that they, they're able to pull off a performance that they did 
and it's only the couple weeks into school. So uh, I want to congratulate all of our student musicians and their uh, Tino D'Agostino and Cheryl Cristo, who um, are their, their leaders. The Performing Arts Department is in raising money for the trip that they're going to be taking uh, this winter has, is having a yard sale on Sunday. And I'm, I'm doing a little bit of marketing here. So if you're coming by the, um, the school, please stop by and know that this is a benefit for the, for the music department. Um, I do want to, because there's been a lot of, in the news recently about concussion policies and implementation of concussion policies, and I just want to pass on an, um, a, an anecdotal statement that our director of nursing, uh, Sue Franke, told me the other day. It came up in a discussion with a trainer at a college, uh, specifically Northeastern, saying that, that are already Arlington has a reputation of being the gold standard in terms of what we're doing around concussions. So I just think it's important for you to know that we, the committee has worked and the policies, policies and procedures have worked on that policy, but it, it's important for you to know that it's really being implemented and implemented well. And to have a college trainers tell us that they, that's the case, um, that's, that's terrific. And that's what we wanna see happen. Um, Mr. Hainer wanted to mention, have me mention that the Medco conference this year is on December 6th, and any of you are welcome to, to go to that. We do need to sign you up, so if you're interested, if you let Karen know, we can do that. All right. The other thing I want to encourage parents about, we don't have 100% yet of people going in and making sure that they can get into the parent portal and um, making sure that they've changed any information that's key, phone numbers, emails, and so forth, because we are, while we, while we could still exercise our Alert Now um, system, we want to make sure that at the time we actually are testing it, that we have, um, that we have good data, good contact information. Can, can I just add something to that? There was a request from some parents that the testing has started rolling out for the alert yeah. now. There was a request that perhaps it could be done in the evening so people aren't panicked. They see the phone call, call coming in and they're panicked that something's wrong from, uh. for their kid. And so they felt it would be better to have, you know, if you're rolling out a big phone call for a test to do it in the evening so that you're not, you know where your kids are, you're not worried for a phone call from school. Yeah. Sure. Oh, pass, it, pass it on. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Right, good suggestion. Thank you. I also, um, there were a couple of parents of students who graduated uh, who are no longer in the system who have wanted to know how they get off of that because they don't care if there's school anymore. <laughs> um, so yeah. I don't know how we do that. The, and there didn't seem to be any place on the website for them to, like, get. they just didn't Opt know who out. to get in touch Opt with. Out. And so if I have them. <laughs> if they well, double their contribution can, to AEF, they're off. <laughs> uh, put something on the that's, website that's the about how that's to good. opt out. Uh, it, generally, what happens when the student rolls over, then it automatic there's a, there's a uh, matchup that goes between Alert Now and um, the uh, student management system, data management system. Um, let me check into that. Okay, thanks. That's all I have. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, moving on to consent agenda, all items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests, in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Approval of warrant 14-35, dated 9-12-13. Total warrant amount $528,321.97. And no draft minutes. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those against? Okay, moving on to subcommittee and liaison reports. Policies and procedures. Okay. Mr. Thielman. We have a first reading on... Uh, the educator evaluation policies. The policies that we have are inconsistent with our new, with the contract and with uh, state regulations or state laws, so they have to be revised. Um, and Rob revised them. So the first one 
is the educator evaluation. So it's no longer evaluation of professional staff. A GCO is educator evaluation. The language that Rob has laid out here, and I'm going to let him talk to this in a minute, is consistent with our uh, collective bargaining agreement. The next um, GCO-R and GCO-1-R are no longer um, necessary and are also inconsistent with the law and the contract. And so GCO-2-R <coughs> needs to become GCO-R, evaluation of teachers and administrators, and the language in there, um, that, that, the, edits, the edits make it consistent with our contract. So basically, that's what we're doing. We're just updating the policies to make them consistent with the law and the contract. I don't know, Rob, but I mean, mm -hmm. is that it. about it? <laughs> okay. That's it. That's it. Are there any questions? Oh, it looks good. Okay, so it's only a first reading, so it's a chance for people to look through it if they have any, if they can think of anything. The second thing was we were directed by the chair uh, at the last uh, meeting, and we acted very promptly, Mr. Very chairman. Prompt we turned this like around that. right away. Uh, so we were asked to look at uh, policy BDEB, School Committee Liaisons to Individual Schools. And after discussion, um, we we came up with this idea of uh, uh, having the school committee chair request the PTO parent advisory councils of the district's schools name liaisons to the school committee. And what we thought, what we uh, decided we would do at our last meeting was put this out for first reading tonight, ask the chairman to... Uh, solicit feedback from the PTOs and the advisory councils to see if this is a good idea and then have a second read on it in two weeks with your feedback. Sounds great. Any questions on that? And that's it. Well, we have uh, some second reads ready for, or no? No, no okay. second reads. Today. No, no, no. Oh, okay. No, no second. And there's a bunch of other things we're working on. If you see in the minutes, there's a bunch of other policies we're working on. We're just not ready to pre present them yet. We need to do some more research. Thank you very much. You bet. Budget. Um, we met uh, a week and a half ago. Um, the uh, most of our meeting was spent talking about how we can um, use the new tool that Ms. Johnson has created to help us kind of better um, plan out further, um, especially considered the headline on those of you who don't get the advocate, but we were the headline enrollments elementary enrollment spike right there. Um, so we, along with a handful of other towns um, in the state, saw um, a significant increase, especially in the elementary schools this year. Um, and so we, I had talked to Diane and, and she brought forth something that allows us to actually um, look at our budget from the point of view of also taking into account growth um, in the schools, especially when we have growth like that. So, um, you know, we can, we can keep taking in a certain percentage of kids every year, but when we have spikes like that, it really does make a difference. And so it's really important that people understand um, that although we have all those kids, our budget that we were assigned and voted did not assume that level of kids coming in. So, you know, some things have to, you know, um, that number of children is at least you know two more teachers and all the things that go along with opening a classroom and that kind of thing so just trying to get our heads around what the impact of you know enrollment is and what the impact of a lot of things are on the budget and kind of being able to roll that up and so that when we go to a lot of these planning meetings that we can now show where we think our budget will be um, in the next three to five years um, and kind of what that looks like you know with things that we know are going to go up like energy costs and you know enrollment although maybe hopefully not as big of a rise as we've seen this year so it was very interesting it was a very good um, meeting uh, we also um, started looking at and attempting to lay out the budget calendar only to realize that we had uh, a shortage of meetings in November and December due to uh, where the calendar falls um, so we did not finish that because we didn't have the date. So um, one of the motions that I need to make out of that is to, uh, I would like to move uh, to add or change the meetings in November and December of this year to the following, that we would hold two meetings in November on Thursday, November 14th and Thursday, November 21st, and two meetings in December on Thursday, December 12th and Thursday, December 19th. Second. Second. Mm -hmm. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those all right. against? 
Um, and we are having our next meeting then on uh, October 3rd, uh, which uh, we will, the, basically the agenda is to set that uh, budget calendar, bring forth a uh, draft of the budget calendar for this coming year. So hopefully we'll have that for the next meeting. Great. Okay? Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you. Community relations? We will be meeting in October, working on a date. Great. Uh, curriculum instruction assessment and accountability. Nothing to report. Thank you. Facilities? I was hoping to report we were going to have a meeting, but we had a minor problem. I, my goal is to have a meeting date set for, and probably have the meeting prior to the next meeting. <laughs> we have here. Uh, if I could just add one little thing. I had uh, uh, a meeting with Mr. Good to, to uh, start the, the feasibility and, the, and uh, possibly a survey. Uh, on going paperless and he indicated to me that the town is very itself the selectmen are very interested in doing this and so uh, We have another he and I have another meeting and hopefully with the, uh, the town manager to work together with the selectmen uh, on a similar project That's great um, And I would just like to um, going back to what we were discussing a little little while ago talk about the fact that there's going to be a meeting of the long-range planning committee at town hall on October 24th at 8 a.m. That meeting will be uh, to discuss uh, the high school and where we go based on the New England Association of Schools and Colleges and their report and what we've talked about tonight. And uh, the Stratton, the Stratton School will also be on the agenda for that morning, October 24th. What time? 8 a.m. Oh, and I'm sorry, I forgot. Um, there is a meeting of the Budget Revenue Task Force, for those of you who attend those meetings, um, at 6 p.m. on Monday, October 7th, in the Selectman's Hearing Room. So if you didn't get the invitation, um, that's when the next one of those is. Thank you. All right, moving on to Secretary's Report. All right, um, let's see. The correspondence we have received for the past, since our last meeting, was uh, an invitation to the Bill Shea Library Memorial Dedication in the Thompson School from 2 to 4 this Sunday, September 29th. A copy of the letter from NIASC granting accreditation to AHS, but warning us about our facilities. A copy of the press release regarding the APS accountability report. A copy of the MCAS data for the Arlington Public Schools. A copy of letter sent to parents from district attorney regarding truancy. Copy of the budget subcommittee meet it minutes from 9 uh, September 18th, 2013. Um, a save the date invitation to the METCO Directors Association Conference being held on Friday, December 6th, 2013 at the Four Points by Sheraton Norwood. Um, an education client alert from Murphy, Hess, Toomey, and Lahane about changes to the anti-bullying law. Um, and email from Dr. Bodhi highlighting MCAS results in the district. Mr. Slick. Uh, I, I got individually, I don't know if we got individually as members, a uh, request from MASC to select a delegate for the uh, annual meeting. I did not get that. Okay. Okay. Uh, then that's something we should do uh, in the as near future. As a district? As a district. We need to elect one of us to represent us at the yeah. annual meeting. Never on Friday, that. November, whatever. Eighth. November 8th. Right. Did you get that correspondence? Uh, I didn't get that correspondence. Okay. Did not get you're, that. You're special, Paul. Yeah. Ex president. I that, uh, club. Yeah. I get that correspondence. Usually the practice is that the chair goes unless the chair can't go, and then. Yeah, we'll, we'll definitely talk because I may have a conflict that night. But we, we, we uh, they I need I a form of election. Yeah. So, you know, if, so it, we can... it, it's Friday afternoon. So I, oh, it's I, in the afternoon? Great. It's an afternoon thing, and I hope that uh, we'll have a lot of folks. On, uh, I hope we have a lot of folks at the conference for the awards dinner on Thursday night Special because night. we have an outstanding member of this committee who was being honored as an all-state school committee member, and I couldn't be more pleased to to note that my friend and Don't colleague, Mr. Thielman, Don't tell you, gave it away. Oh. Gave it away. He didn't know about it. I mean, it was going to be held. I mean, until he didn't know about it. I know, I know. Jeez. Huh? We, we voted this in a, we, secret we voted the nomination. He wasn't, he, he wasn't here. I heard about it. <laughs> he voted the minutes. Congratulations, Mr. Thielman. Congratulations. 
she she slipped me out. <laughs> yeah, she told him the night of the meeting. Uh, yeah. So very, very anyway. great news. Okay. <laughs> um, I'd like to make a motion to move into executive session if there's no other business tonight um, in open session. Okay. Move into executive session to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with union and or non-union personnel or contract negotiations with union and or non-union in which if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect and to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation if in an open meeting they have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigation position of the public body and the chair so declares. Second. All those in favor, roll call. Aye. 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 Now in executive session, exiting only for the purposes of adjournment. I should say.